and let me get the PowerPoint up. And then Steve, I'm going to hand it over to you and we'll get it going. Fantastic. First and foremost, thank you very much for having me on today. Um, I would certainly be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Evan and the great crew at USTA Middle States for the invitation. Um, it's a, a privilege and a pleasure to be with all of you. And, and before anyone throws something in about my Zoom photo, no, I am not in New York. Um, like a lot of you, I wish I was. This is the first open uh, that we've all missed in a long time. Um, but uh, you got to give credit where credit's due, and the USTA has just done a phenomenal job with both events. So if you had an opportunity to catch the Western and Southern and the subsequent open that followed uh, that we're all viewing right now, it's, it's just been unbelievable. The tennis has been great. The reports that we've been getting on the ground are incredible. It's just very buttoned up, and it's been a very, very well-run event. So... We're gonna go ahead and, and get started here. So topic today, generational coaching. So we're gonna to touch on a lot of different topics. We're gonna to touch on communication. We're gonna talk about demonstration. And as promised in the description, we're also gonna have a, a brief touch at the end on the accreditation, which I know a lot of you are very familiar with. So I wanna give you some ins and outs in terms of, of the progress that we've made and uh, the framework that's actually being put in place now. So without any further ado, buckle up everybody, let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I wanna do is, um, we're gonna go ahead and, and switch over to the next one, Evan, is we're gonna get into qualities of a competent coach. And before I really get rambling here, uh, for those of you who think you're just gonna sit there and just gather a lot of information, you've got another thing coming. So I really want you to be engaged in this, I do want you to populate the chat because I'm gonna throw a couple of questions out and like anything uh, or any other presentation, feedback is a gift, good, bad, and different. So please don't hesitate to populate that as we move through. So if, and it looks like everybody is familiar with the chat right now, so we should be in really good shape. So the first question that I wanna to pose to you is, Share your thoughts on some essential qualities of a competent coach that would work with multi-generational players. Let's go ahead and populate the chat. I want to see what you come up with. What are some key ingredients or essential qualities? I like that peg. Yasmin, look at that. Anne, empathy, communication, patience, good listener, player-centered. Wow, I'd sure love to work with all of these people. You talk about great comments right out of the, the gate. Ed McQuillan, outstanding answer. Excellent, these are great. You're all over, gang, right off the bat. Excellent. And you're right, these are qualities of a competent coach. And again, it's, it's very important to remember because I think from time to time we get in a rut, we get going and we take a lot of these things for granted. And that's the one thing that we don't want to do. We really want to make sure that we are really laser focused on these qualities. Because again, the more we really start to focus and concentrate on providing a quality experience, the better off we're going to be. So we're going to go ahead and move it forward. And I wanna to touch very briefly on the many hats that a competent coach will wear. And again, they're interchangeable. And in many cases, you're wearing multiple hats at the same time. But we all know that effective coaches need to be motivated. And they've gotta be motivators. They've gotta model professional behavior. Um, they really are pied pipers in that sense. We wanna make sure that we coach for results and the results are, are collaborative. So in other words, it can't be all about you. We're not coach-centered, we are player-centered. So finding out their needs and doing a little bit of an analysis in that area goes a long way. We wanna help athletes of all ages achieve potential and we want them to realize that potential. And 
And again, going back to the previous piece on coaching for results, in many cases, again, we get set in our ways in terms of, hey, this is my philosophy. This is the same cadence I've had for the last 20 odd years. It's worked well for me. I've produced X, Y, and Z. But again, we're into a little bit of a different world right now. So again, I'm gonna talk about stretching a little bit later on in the presentation. But let's go ahead and keep going um, down this line. So after, oh, I'm sorry, Evan, not quite yet. There we go. That was my fault. That was not Evan, so I don't want anyone to put anything bad in the chat box on that. <laughs> sorry about that, Steve. No, 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 all good. So when we talk about skill, we're talking about multiple things. We're talking about, it could be technical, it could be tactical development. Um, it could be increasing mental and, and physical skill sets. There's a lot to take into account regarding skill. A lot of people think, well, it's just a, hey, can I rip that forehand down the line like Jennifer Brady? There's a lot more to it, and we all know that as a competent coach. We also need to provide support. That's one thing that's very important. If you are truly a player-centered coach, you are constantly providing support, knowledge, and advice based on the, your, your player in front of you and their needs. So I want you to, again, I'm gonna leave this up for just a minute, let everybody take a look at this. And I want you to pretty much, you know, self-analyze or, or, or go through a, more or less a self-checklist. See if you check off in all of those areas. And I'm not asking for anyone to, to hop on the chat at this point, but again, if you recognize one of the areas that's listed as uh, maybe I'm not quite as, as solid in that area as I thought, it's a good thing to jot down because again, we're gonna talk about goals as we start moving through this a little bit more. Okay, Ev, let's go ahead and kick it forward. So in terms of qualities of an effective demonstration, this is a real big piece. We're gonna talk about the new certification and the new education pathway a little bit later in the presentation, but the one thing that we have determined, and I think that everyone would be in complete agreement on this, is you, you must have an effective demonstration capability as a coach. So I do wanna go back to the chat. I'd like you to go ahead and populate uh, in your mind what some of the qualities of an effective demonstration would be, and let's see what you come up with. Amanda. Great seeing you, or great reading you in this case. Clear, concise, energy, eye contact, well done, short. What else have you got? Don't be shy, folks. Like I said, I want you to engage. This is very important because, again, we can learn from each other. Clear, simple, safe, footwork, confirm understanding. Wow, well done, Peg. Where the pro is placed. Justin Landis stealing my thunder. I love it. No wonder he won the trivia contest, Evan. Concise statements, no names. Excellent. You guys are all over this. Positive body language on the player's level. Fantastic. Praise. Keep it simple. Fantastic. Okay, Evan, let's go ahead and move it forward. Gang, I tell you what, you're all over this and, and you're spot on. What I wanna try to do is I wanna keep it very simple, um, very similar to Tony's comment on the keep it simple. We'll skip the last S on it. But what we've come up with is a three-step process. It's as simple as being able to stop. And if you take a look at Coach Rita Gladstone, I know that that picture is a little bit small. But you'll notice she has everyone's attention. Everyone can see her. Everyone can hear her. So she is, in effect, managing and organizing the demonstration. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's a critical piece to an effective demonstration. So in other words, being able to get people gathered so they can see and hear, that should be the immediate first step in the process. Once you've done that and you've captured your audience, the next thing is the show portion of this. 
So culturally in the United States and with all the travel that I've done over the years in my current position and in my past life, we tend to be very talkative as coaches. So, and you have coaches that really like to ramble. They, it's almost like they, they really love to be able to share all of their expertise, get every little nugget out there. And it creates a little bit of a paralysis by analysis environment with the student. So the one thing that we're really going to try to focus on moving forward with all of our, our new folks coming into the coaching industry is to really effectively give them an opportunity to show. We have recognized that the majority of students out there, regardless of age and ability, they're visual learners. So let's make sure that we are clear and concise, but more importantly, let's make sure that we show them the path. It could be as simple as something uh, regarding movement. It could be the path of the racket. But the bottom line is we're trying to get away from that coach standing on the opposite side of the net or having their back turned to a captive audience and just basically regurgitating information. So again, we're better than that. The final piece is once you have established the stop in the show, let's get them going. So in other words, there's nothing worse than having a student just sit and listen to the banter. They wanna try it, okay? You got my attention, I'm all ears, I'm all eyes for that matter with the show portion of it. I really wanna give it a try. And that's something that's extremely important. So Go also references switching of players, rotating players. But again, if you keep it as simple as stop, show, and then go, in your mind, you're going to provide a quality demonstration. I'm gonna hold up there for a moment. Anybody else wanna go ahead and hop on the chat and add anything to that? because I think it's pretty cut and dry, but there may be another nugget out there. That's the great thing about these sessions. And to go ahead and reiterate what I said before, we learn from each other. And the more little nuggets that we do capture from each other, the better. Doesn't seem to be any additions to that, so I think we're in pretty good shape. One last little section that I wanna touch on before we move to the next slide is we do have to make sure that we get into a check for understanding mode. So one of the things, and again, you can all think of current students you have or students in the past, you're addressing them and you'll see them smiling and nodding their head as you're going through all the little, you know, bits and pieces of, of what the drill or the activity is going to be. And then how many of you have gotten out there and then you start the activity or the drill or the game and you end up stopping it within two minutes. It's like, no, 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 hang on, time out, time. That's not at all what the intent of this activity was. And a lot of that, again, goes back to the culture of talking too much. In other words, we make assumptions as coaches that everyone is going to understand every little piece or every little snippet that we give to them. So by incorporating a check for understanding as you're moving through this demonstration will serve you well. By checking for that understanding, you're gonna make sure, hey, Sally, where are we moving again? To the right, to the left? Oh, fantastic. Um, so, so Scott, tell me as you close into the net, what do we wanna see you do prior to making that volley? So again, asking these questions or at least getting confirmation that they do understand will serve you well. Okay, let's go ahead and keep moving it forward, Evan. Let's see what we've got. So we wanna get into the, the main crux of our session today. And this is where we wanna get into some considerations in working with different generations of students. So this is partly communication. It, it basically builds on a number of different areas. And I'm very fortunate to work with a cohort of coaches from different sports. So the USTA works with a group called the USCCE and we're dealing with the Director of Coaching Education for lacrosse, hockey. Again, it's kind of a, a, a great group or a great cohort to be able to share a lot of experiences and a lot of education that they've developed. So I've taken a lot of information that I've gathered, not only from different sports, 
but I've also taken a lot that are very applicable to, to what we deal with on a daily basis. So the one thing that I do want to mention, there is a caveat here. So I'm not going to get gender specific as we move through this, but at the same time, I do want to make sure that, that we do cover off and, and take into account that, you know, a lot of these are multi-sport faceted and can be used in a wide variety of circumstances. And again, this list is not by any uh, stretch of the imagination complete. There are obviously a truckload of considerations to take into account. So please keep that in mind. So let's go ahead and, and move forward into our next piece. Let's talk about youth. So the one thing that we have to keep in, in mind at all times, it's number one. We need to assess what they can comprehend. And we absolutely have to adjust expectations. Remember, when you are working with young children, they have no experience to go on. So with no experience, again, it's hard to really recognize what some sort of expectation is. We've all dealt with different ages, different levels. You've got people that are extremely coordinated at an early age, others that struggle a little bit more. So again, we've got to really personalize this and make it individual to the player. Consider the amount of information provided. Great story on this. So when researching um, a, a previous program that I worked on, we always had the McDonald's analogy. When you walk into a McDonald's, you've got you know, 25, 30 options. But when you look at a child's menu, how many choices do they have? Only a couple. Why? Because if not, they're gonna stand there for five minutes. Well, I'm not sure do I want so again, keeping that in mind, the amount of information you provide, keep it simple, keep it short, keep their attention span, and you'll be in good shape. Number three, I think is extremely important. Fear is often present. We do see that quite a bit. So in other words, that fear of the unknown, as I, as I mentioned with uh, the first bullet point, with little to no prior experience, they're not sure of themselves at an early age. So again, there is a bit of a fear factor. You will get some children, they will hold their hand up. Yes, I will volunteer to go first, but let's not forget about that, that little girl or little boy who tends to hide behind a taller student. Very similar to being in a classroom where the eyes go down, I don't want the teacher to call on me. So again, we have to keep that in the front of the mind at all times. I really like number four because it actually came up in the chat, communicate at the child's level. And I added two pieces in here, to their vocabulary and to their height. So Seth Walrath, my good friend up in Middle States, who stands six foot, he's a big guy. So for Seth to go out there and work with a bunch of pre-K kids standing at six foot whatever, it can be a little daunting. Now, Seth being the father of two beautiful young girls, I know that he would take a knee and get down to eye level and really get that good association going. It's less intimidating. And again, you are having that face-to-face -face conversation. Five, listen thoughtfully. Again, it's amazing. You remember the show, you know, kids say the darnest things. They do say the darnest things, but at the same time, some of the feedback that they're actually giving you uh, you can really help navigate, you know, future lesson plans and how to actually negotiate and work with that child if you listen, <coughs> excuse me, to a lot of their responses. It goes hand in hand with number six, let them express themselves. If they're having fun, they're going to let you know they're having fun. If it's not something that's fun, you're going to be able to read body language. They may not say it, but again, it's very important to allow them at least that expression. Number seven is a gimme. Yes, we have to exercise patience at all time. I know a lot of coaches that are not parents. They shy away from working with this demographic. Again, it, it really is a true exercise of, in patience in working with this younger demographic. Listening to parents. We do want to monitor and, and have their feedback. It is something that's extremely important. Monitor stress, anxiety. There could be extenuating circumstances with the child that you may not know about. So again, getting their feedback, especially at a young age, is critical. And number nine, you must always control your emotions. 
So whatever baggage you've had during your day, as you walk through that fence, through that curtain, if you're indoors, you've got to check it at the door. So again, it's extremely important. And again, I could go on and on. I've got a list of about 25 and I just narrowed it down to these nine with working with youth. And again, these should serve you very well. I'm gonna pause there for a second. Any, anything else that anyone would like to add on the chat, by all means, go for it. Especially those of you who are working with this demographic, because we've got a lot of coaches that work exclusively with 10 and under players. Any other gems you'd like to share with the group? Fun, absolutely. Excellent, Allison, absolutely. Don't be afraid to let them see you struggle. These are all great points. Energy is key, without a doubt. Again, you're in that Pied Piper mode, everyone. So again, these kids are gonna pick up on your vibe, absolutely, from minute one to closing. So again, you've gotta be at your peak with this. Okay. We're going to go ahead and kick it forward into our next piece. And I want to talk a little bit more about our fun adolescent players. So for those of you who are working with middle school, high school age players, this is always a fun group. So number one, and this was the number one answer, uh, again, coming with multiple sports, these children are typically dependent but desire growth toward independence. Absolutely. So in other words, when you think about it, if I'm 11, 12 years old, I can't drive yet. So I can't drive myself to tennis. I'd sure love to be able to do that one day. Um, yeah, mom, dad still occasionally carry my racket bag time. I should, we, run, we see that all the time. But again, at this age, and especially with their peers, they are absolutely 100% striving toward gaining more independence. And that's part of the, the growing process. We also have to acknowledge developmental challenge, physical, social, puberty, and the onset of puberty, obviously with these kids coming up, it does play a role. We've all heard the old adage of, you know, they're at an awkward age. This is the time period where they are in that awkward age. So we have to continually offer respect. We wanna make sure that um, we address performance concerns and confidence uh, with age. I heard a great story the other day of a young girl in an academy setting, and this was not a high performance setting whatsoever. But the young girl did not want to publicly say anything to the coach because they were going to end up having challenge matches over the course of the next week. So the young girl didn't want to publicly say in front of her peers what she felt she needed to work on. And I thought that that's really, you know, a great point that she made. She wanted to talk to the coach off to the side and let the coach know, hey, this is exactly what I'm concerned about going into my challenge matches. So that's a really good one. And I think in many cases, we end up missing that one. So again, tuck that one away. We always have to continue to educate. We've all run into that child, that stubborn one who thinks that they know it all. I know everything. I, you know, pop, 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 pop. We listen to them. <coughs> again, we encourage them but we have to, continuing to continue to educate them throughout the process. In many cases, they act like they know it all, but you know that they're storing away some of the tips and some of the feedback that's been given. Encourage feedback. This is the, really the age where we really start trying to get into specifics. It can't be, hey, how'd it go today? You know, they're gonna say fine, good, great. That simple, you know, closed question where we're getting one word responses. Make sure that your questions are very open ended. Make sure that you get something that's more than a yes or a no. Really importantly here, listen. Make sure that you are capturing the feedback that's being given. It can't go in one ear and out the other. And these kids at this age, they'll pick up on it. <clears throat> very similar to our youth. Let these children express themselves. So in other words, a little bit of fun goes a long way. I saw a great presentation that came out of Tennis Europe about a month ago. And I'll never forget as a coach, you know, many, many years ago, I used to get so rattled at the kids during ball pickups. And they would do these crazy games. 
They try to feed a ball and get it into the hopper or the cart. They'd shoot baskets. And according to this coach over in tennis Europe, they've started to allow it. And they've actually encouraged the kids to actually get into that in a short time period. In other words, you don't give them, you know, obviously 10 minutes to do it. But it encourages a lot of athletic development and the encouragement to grow certain skill sets. So it's something to consider. So on that note, avoid quick judgmental attitude. So make sure that you're not too quick to jump on the bandwagon of, you know, good, bad. In other words, it's a work in progress, especially at this age. So when you think about growth and you think about development, maturation of a child going through this phase, we cannot be too quick uh, coming out of the gate in terms of judgment. You've gotta be fair. Very big piece here, number eight, set fair limits and enforce consistently. You know, if you are consistent in your approach, obviously you're establishing a culture and that's critical. So we really wanna make sure that you are doing it on a consistent basis. And again, uh, you were very influential. So again, I cannot forget number nine again, model professional behavior at all times. Okay, let's go ahead and move it forward, Evan. I think we've hit the adolescence pretty hard and very heavy. So <clears throat> yes, let's stretch, literally. And what I mean by this is I know that everyone here is committed to growing as a coach or you wouldn't be here with us today. So with that, I wanna take a look at a challenge that I put together for each and every one of you. And if you've coached for any length of time, as I stated before, it's very easy to get into a rut or a pattern of doing the same old, same old. So I want you to take the time for a moment here and reflect and stretch your skill sets. So in other words, really lean into discomfort here for a minute and think about some of the items that I've just mentioned and see if these are, in, are applicable to you or if there's an area where you know that you could improve your performance. Pick that, think about that, and try to set a goal toward improving your performance. Execute the goal and professionally grow. That's what we're all about. So I'm gonna give you a minute really to kind of think about that for just a moment. And steal a sip while I'm parched. U.S. Open Cup, folks. Okay, we shall go ahead and move it forward. So as we move into our final stretch, we start getting into adults and seniors. This is obviously a great group to work with. So in other words, you're not dealing with growing pains. You're not you know, dealing with that child who got a C on their biology exam. So again, we've kind of separated out and we are now dealing with peers. So in other words, these are all adults. These are all people, and in some cases, younger, same age, and older than you are. So right off the bat, number one, coming in, gain their respect, connect. Extremely important to find that channel where you can connect with that individual and really more or less create a seamless communication line with that person. Find out what makes them tick. You know, why are they there? Is it for the social? Is it for the physical? Do I want a good workout? Hey, I really want to improve my backhand volley. It could be anything. It could be everything for that matter. But again, getting to know them instead of just creating a general lesson plan is something that, that's important. By serving a group, if you're doing a lot of group lessons with adults, you might find a lot of commonalities and it'll really help tailor make obviously your lesson plans um, and make life a lot easier for you. The third one I found very interesting, uh, get to know them professionally, get a little background information. Uh, it can go a long, a long way. I'll give you a personal story. Uh, many, many moons ago, I taught somebody who was a mechanical engineer and they loved knowing all the technical aspects of how to hit a tennis ball. And it wasn't just on the serve, it was really on everything. They wanted a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step breakdown of how something worked. Not everyone is wired that way. But as soon as I found out that that's what this person did professionally, 
I knew how to actually engage that person quite a bit better. So on ball pickups and, and uh, conversations that we ended up having off court, I really developed a, a, a good rapport, which we're gonna get into next, with that person in terms of, of getting on the same page uh, with language. So again, I just touched on rapport and consistent approach. Um, the one thing that we've got to do is we've really got to make sure that we develop skill sets with achievable goals in mind. There's nothing worse, and it gets into number six of being a false prophet. It's so good to be a cheerleader. Oh, guarantee you, we're going to have you up to four or five and six months. Really? So again, we've, we've got to be realistic in terms of the approach that we take with people. We don't want to come across as being con artists. Again, evaluate what you have in front of you. You, you can obviously take a look, whether it be through an orientation or the first couple of sessions, to get an idea of where that person really is. Um, encourage feedback. I'm going to jump forward here a little bit. Make sure that you do get feedback, obviously, from the adults. It's critical. You really want to make sure that they are engaged with you. Yes, you are a subject matter expert. When you step onto the court inside those lines, it's your office. But at the same time, without that feedback, good, bad, indifferent, it's, it can be a little more of a challenge with certain folks. So make sure that you've got that. Again, allow them to express themselves. Um, you want to create, and this is a biggie, especially with adults, a constructive criticism culture. And the only reason why I typed that in is I wanted to see how many C's I could get on one light item, create a constructive criticism culture. But in fairness here, we want to make sure that, again, we're not just loading them up with fluff. The majority of people that you work with, they want to improve. Almost everyone wants to improve. But how you establish the critique and in, in giving them the vehicle or the protocol to establish that and then gain from it is extremely important. Formulate your thoughts. Make sure that you put your suggestions together so they can really digest that in a way that will be effective. And again, it'll go a long way. This is a little bit different with 11 and 12, um, particularly 11. In this age of technology, you know, people get online. Hey, I looked at this tennis site. I saw this coaching site. I saw, you know, these great tips on YouTube. You may have some favorites that you really like and some people that have done a good job in an online environment. By all means, encourage that. Yeah, but, you know, take a look at this presentation on X, Y, Z, whatever it is. So in other words, you're not trying to steer them out to go out and get all of these different opinions, but definitely steer them you know, towards supplemental resources. They're going to do it anyway. And this is one of the great pieces of feedback that I found out with the cohort that I was talking about. People are going to research no matter what, but if you steer them into a direction of something that you feel is quality and competent, you're only helping yourselves because again, they're gonna appreciate that tip. And again, model professional behavior at all times. So let's go ahead and move it forward here a little bit. Um, I wanna stop here for a second, make sure that uh, I breathe first of all. And also I wanna to touch on any questions that may be out there from the crew. So does anybody have anything based on what I've just given you um, or need clarification in an area? Now's the time to go ahead and populate that chat. How are we doing? Good or bad idea? I like this, George, thank you. Um, look to share rewarding, sorry, it's cut off. I'm gonna move this over so I can see it a little bit better. Look to share rewarding students who do muscle actions well by asking them to demo. Everyone got, a, got to join a demo today except Billy. That may hurt his feelings. Of course, do not pick those who don't do it well. Uh, or do not know how to do it. I totally hear where you're coming from with that, George. We do want engagement. And again, it's, it's no different than sitting in the classroom. I know that my son just did something on state capitals early in the school year. And, you know, obviously knew him, so he wasn't afraid to put his hand up and ask. But there are others, and again, you've all seen it in that environment, who shy away from it. So again, if you've got people 
um, that are willing to step up and demonstrate by all means. Be very careful about picking people that may not be prepared or may not do it exceptionally well. You will have some that don't do it exceptionally well, but will still want to volunteer and demonstrate. Not a problem whatsoever. Bring them out, coach them through it, offer feedback. And in fact, in many cases, you can take a situation like that and be able to identify certain things. Maybe the person doesn't do extremely well and you can give some tips on how to improve that performance because you really are putting them into an individual setting instead of a group setting. So in a way, you know, it's, it's not bad. But again, it's a judgment call through and through. I think I'll leave it at that in terms of, of where you go. Um, if there aren't any others, I'm gonna go ahead and move us forward a little bit because I do wanna get into, as promised on the description of this, um, an accreditation update. So I wanna first start out by clarifying what's involved with accreditation. So the USTA entered into accreditation um, mode with the two organizations based on the fact that they really wanted to improve and increase the standards of coaches coming into the industry. So there were two major indicators that were constant in terms of the research that was done prior to getting into the accreditation process. There were a lot of coaches that were aging out of the industry and the two organizations were having a, a challenge in terms of replenishing people that were leaving with newbies coming in. Along with that, it wasn't, or it was the quantity and also it dealt with the quality of coaches that were coming into the industry. We felt like there needed to be a better base or a foundational layer of these coaches coming into uh, teaching organizations um, rather than just join an organization, show up for a test, receive a certificate, you know, you're blessed, there it is, you know, you can coach. We really wanted to make sure that we established, again, a solid foundation for these coaches that were coming in. On that note, both USPTA and PTR are now fully accredited. So they are working in collaboration with the USTA on what this framework is going to look like for the new education and certification pathway. So essentially what it's going to look like, and again, I apologize, I don't have any slides because this is still a work in progress. As you can see from the type in there, this doesn't officially launch until the new year. So with that being said, I don't have a lot of promotional material that I can share because again, it, it, it's still actually in construction right now. But we're looking at four levels. And the first level is going to be a brand new category for coaches coming into the industry. And level one will consist of a certified instructor category. So Basically, coaches coming in will receive that baseline education that I'm talking about. We'll give them some really sound uh, fundamentals that they can work through and start out as an instructor. Many people will gravitate toward this, we feel, because you've got a, a fair amount of people that volunteer or currently assist programs. Uh, they may work seasonally or with camps. In other words, they're not coaching or teaching in a full-time capacity. It's not their career. But for those people that are assisting uh, in that capacity, we wanna make sure that again, they've got a, a, a good foundation or a good layer to work off of, and, and that's extremely critical. We will have a percentage of these people that will gravitate, gravitate toward professional certification that will become the new level two. And that will be a little more extensive. So in other words, there will, there will be two workshops, two face-to-face -face workshops combined with a, uh, a pretty robust set of online education and courses uh, that they'll have to work through in order to achieve uh, professional status. So when you take a look at those two levels, that will make up the majority of, of what our, our, our coaching faculty is going to look like nationally over the next X number of years. We hope to substantially grow 
the number of, of quality providers that are out there. And the only way we feel that we can do that is to raise the standards of coaches coming in. We all recognize the fact that we've struggled with retention. And it's kind of scary when talking with other sports, lacrosse, hockey, soccer, some of these other major sports that we're competing with, it doesn't make me feel better, but to know that we're in the same boat they are in terms of retention, it does ease the pain a little bit because we've got a lot of people that will try or sample a sport. They'll give it a fair shake and then over a period of time, they may realize, hey, it's not for me. I'll go and I'll try something else. But we feel if we do a better job, at least from an education standpoint, we stand a much better chance of, of retaining that person we are blessed in the fact that we have a lifetime sport. So the longer we can keep these people engaged, the better off we're all going to be. And that's extremely important at this particular point. Let me briefly describe the, the, the following two levels. We have a level three uh, proposed uh, specialty level, and that's for, for professionals that would like to specialize in an area. I'll give you an example. Maybe they want to specialize in performance or in ten and under. Maybe they aspire eventually one day to become a director of tennis. So we're going to build some specific education uh, in that level for coaches that really want to distinguish themselves in the job market. So we feel that that's going to be a great opportunity um, for coaches to really expand uh, their knowledge, and differentiate themselves, obviously, in the marketplace. We know how competitive it can be. We also know that you've had a lot of coaches in various roles over the course of their career that certainly aspire to become a head professional or director, and then when they finally land that job, they realize they're not really equipped with the necessary skill sets to be successful. I didn't know anything about human resources, payroll, um, accounts receivable. I don't know, you know, in dealing with certain business uh, operation aspects of a facility. So by going that route, we feel like we can get people uh, better prepared uh, to take on a role like that. So we've really done some, some great work behind the scenes in terms of building that framework out. And again, we probably won't see the level three kick uh, in until probably 2022. Uh, at the earliest, because again, our, our big push right now is to get launched, get that level one, that instructor piece going. Uh, again, level two will subsequently follow in the professional realm, and then we'll get into level three. Level four, we've got, you know, master professionals out there, people that have gone above and beyond uh, in terms of their education to, to achieve a degree of mastery. So we recognize the fact that we have master professionals in both organizations. We also are taking into consideration people that are going back to school and getting master's degrees in coaching education or something specific uh, that can be applied to their current position. So again, we're working on vetting um, both levels three and four and should have an update on that hopefully by the end of the year in terms of what that's going to look like. So one of the questions that we've had um, has been, you know, what are your goals behind this accreditation? You know, it, it's, it sounds good, you know, it feels good, you know, in terms of, of, of what this looks like, but what are you really after with this? And it's really twofold. So if we can improve our delivery system, as I said before, and the quality of the provider in introducing the sport, we know that that's gonna be an instant win. Um, it's gonna keep our sport very healthy for many years to come and hopefully provide a revolving door where coaches see other coaches um, performing or that have gone through the pathway it will probably spur others to come in from behind them and follow suit. So we're really hoping, and I'm not going to give you an exact number in terms of, of what we're looking for at this point, but it is substantial what we would like to do over the course of the next five years. So if we can do that, we're going to be in pretty good shape. So I know that I've just given you a lot in that particular area, 
Um, so I do want to open it up for some questions that may be out there. And I see we've got one from Lori um, regarding high school coaches. Um, what do we have? Allow coaching at the changeover for 90 seconds. That's a tough one because, again, Lori, I tell you what, um, there are so many different high school uh, coaching associations that are out there. Um, we completely agree with you. It's, it's very tough to find any sort of consistency going from state to state, district to district, even section to section. So again, the more buttoned up we can become, obviously, the better. So we, we know the importance of coaching and how important it is to, to, to get our students to, to succeed and improve their performance. Can that happen in a real-time situation on court? Yeah, we're seeing it. So uh, again, it's something that we will continue to look at. We've got a great schools department within USTA. So again, we'll continue to you know, evolve and grow in that particular area. The way we look at it right now, so everyone knows, is nothing is off the table. So in other words, you know, we're not sitting in the, in the fish bowl and just saying, hey, this is, we think it should go this way or that way. Uh, we're really open right now to a lot of communication and feedback. Ah, my good friend, Ann, so good to hear from you. Plan for recruiting and retention of new coaches. And I'm not gonna mince words here. We're throwing a substantial amount of money behind this initiative. Because again, we feel that this is one of the most important pillars for our growth and development for many years to come regarding the health and the welfare of our sport. So if we don't invest in this, shame on us. Uh, we really wanna make sure that, that we are putting our best foot forward, um, not only on our end, but also in, in supporting and assisting the USPTA and PTR uh, with growth in this area. Um, on that point, and Anne, I'm really glad that you brought this up. The one thing that we really want to do is we really want to get more female coaches. Yes, I said it. No hesitation. We also want to get more diverse coaches. We really want to get coaches that really resemble what America currently looks like. So again, we really can do a much better job of growing in some areas. And the more we, we you know, approach this, I think the better we're going to be served in the future. I know there have been a lot of knocks over the years. You're talking to somebody who's been certified for, I'm not gonna tell you how many years, 30 plus years, um, and I've been around a long time. And obviously in my role, I have witnessed and firsthand, I've seen the clicks that have been established. Um, and again, I'm not saying we need to break those up, but we need to revisit, rethink uh, the direction where we're going. And if you take a look at what America really looks like, and you take a look at at, at players coming into our sport, it, it's, it's critical that we really research this and we go down that route. Sylvia, terrific question, fees associated with. Uh, no, not on behalf of USPTA and PTR. So in other words, what we're trying to do is support in every way possible their respective business models. So we are helping them financially we're also doing a very heavy lift in terms of what these standards that I'm mentioning are all about and the framework and the education that's being put together. There are grants that, and um, I should say grants um, and other resources that we are supplying with both organizations to help them out because it is a pretty heavy financial lift uh, to get all of this off the ground. In terms of actual coaches coming into this, Yes, we do want to work on keeping this affordable for coaches coming into it. So yeah, I've laid out this grand plan and, and the one thing we don't want to do is price ourselves out of the market. So anything that we can do in terms of a grant or a scholarship with coaches, we're going to explore every option and make it, again, affordable for people coming from all walks of life to be able to jump in and, and really be able to get some good education moving forward. What else have we got? These are great questions. You guys are rock stars with this. Steve, in the Q&A, uh, there's a question. Will level one and two have access to the coaches curriculum on net generation? The answer to that is a resounding yes, Renee. So in other words, once a coach has been certified, even at the instructor level, they will absolutely have access to uh, all of the coaching curriculum that's available. 
I'm very excited to say too, it's not red, orange, and green anymore, folks. We do have yellow. So that's something extremely important. If you have not logged into net generation in a while, I'd highly encourage you to go in there and take a look at what we've created with the two levels of yellow that are now in there. Because again, it's really good stuff. So we in effect have something all the way from someone who's pre-K through that graduating senior right now. Excellent question. Thank you, Renee. And another question in the Q&A is, uh, what did PTR do to get accredited after not meeting the necessary requirements? It's a great question. Um, without getting you know, too derailed or into the weeds with this, uh, the accreditation was set up initially by USTA with certain parameters and certain markers. And I don't want anyone to think even for a moment that USPTA, you know, instantly got it like that. Um, they were a little bit quicker to receive accreditation um, based on their business model. And so PTR, obviously their board and the structure of their organization, it does differ from USPTA in terms of their governance. But they did meet all the requirements. Again, we were thrilled to have them fully accredited because that way we can really work in a tri-branded and collaborative effort together. Because again, we think it's critical that everyone has skin in the game for that matter and is involved in the process. On that note, and I hope a lot of you have, have taken note with the Move Tennis Forward ad that's being promoted uh, during the US Open, it is tri-branded. So you will see all three of those logos in that 30 second ad. And it is all about promoting education and certification for this next generation of coach coming into the system. So it's a biggie. And another question, will current certification from USPTA and USPTR transfer over? Uh, the short answer on that one also is yes, we're trying to make the determination of how we're going to fit everything in. What we had before was a very closed model. So in other words, if I go back to, you know, when I first was um, certified, and I'm going back into the 80s, um, yeah, so I tease a little bit here. Both organizations were almost identical. So with USPTA, you had P1, P2, P3, uh, PTR had professional instructor, associate instructor. So in other words, they had three levels of certification. And then both organizations really took a turn and a different path. So USPTA merged the three levels into two and PTR completely changed their education pathway and got into more of a specialized approach with 10 and under 11 to 17 performance. So we're having to revisit um, and take a look at both organizations right now to come up with the best solution uh, to take the coaches take into consideration their background, the education that they received when they initially went through certification, and then plug them into the new system. So that's one of the things that we're currently working on right now. So again, we will have more detail down the road. Awesome. Um, the next question is, what types of localized trainings will you be doing in the sections in 2021 for providers? I plan on moving to Philadelphia the day after tomorrow. It's such a great city and great people that I'm just going to come up there and do a training every week. And if I could do that, I would in a heartbeat. I had you all for a second, you have to admit. Um, but in all seriousness, we really want to get on, out on the road as soon as possible. So we recognize the impact that face-to-face -face education has with coaches. They listen, nothing against an online or a virtual approach. Um, but again, really being in the trenches with people and supporting them, we feel is something that, uh, again, you, you can't, by any stretch of the imagination, shortchange. So again, we are working on a robust schedule when all of this is ready. Uh, we can't be everywhere. <coughs> Excuse me, let's be honest. So we cannot be in every single city. We're a big country. So we're taking a look at an approach that will get us into sections, districts, regions, um, where we can really cater uh, to a majority of coaches that are really looking to go to that next level. So again, there's gonna be more to come on that. Obviously, because of present circumstances with COVID, 
we have to do what we're told. In our legal department, we are completely shut down with travel right now for obvious reasons. Because again, we don't want to endanger ourselves, but more importantly, we don't want to gather a bunch of people uh, into a training right now and run the risk of exposing them. So again, we're going to work through this. We're going to make sure that we put ourselves in a safe um, or as much of a safe environment as we can before we really get back on the road and get these going. Super question. Another question, what efforts are being done now to grow PTM programs across the country? Outstanding question. And you would make Scott Schultz very happy right now, um, whoever came up with that particular question. We realize the importance of PTM. And I hate to use golf as an example, but I was watching the tour championship this past weekend, and there was a 30-second clip on Kaiser University, and it's K-E-I. S-E-R, for those of you who want to Google and actually pull up their little infomercial. But it was a fantastic uh, way to advertise new coaches coming into to the system and being able to provide a college education and specialize, obviously, in a PGM program um, was a great avenue. Um, because again, you're, you're learning a specific skill set, getting an education along the way, and it really it gives you a great leg up in terms of competition, in terms of landing a job. So again, we're going to heavily invest in PTM programs, scholarships, uh, grants to universities that are offering these, and, and hopefully grow these over the next few years to get more young people going down that pathway. I do want to mention something very important. I don't want people to immediately uh, put PTM and immediately associate it with an on-court professional. So we've got people that are in stringing. We've got people that are working in uh, business, uh, people that are working for uh, trade manufacturers. We've got people working in a wide variety of roles that have gone through a PTM process. So again, it's not just solely for somebody who's working on court, it's for somebody who's really looking at making a career in tennis in a wide variety of areas. Great question. All right, well, we're right at 1 p.m. So I think we're going to wrap it up there. If any more chats come in, we can surely go and uh, email them to you, Steve. And if you'd like to go and my, respond to those, we can do that. Yeah. It's okay. On my very last slide, I, I had included oh. my e that's all right, on my email address. And so I don't believe in, in uh, goodbyes. I only believe in so long. So it's, it's great to see so many people I personally know and professionally know on this call. I can't thank you enough for actually being here. And again, to the fine crew at Middle States for hosting this. But again, any feedback that you've got, please don't hesitate to send it my way. I'm, I will gladly share this with our team. And when you stop and think about it, we truly are all in this together. So a big thank you, Evan and crew. Not a problem. Steve, we, we thank you again for, for taking the time to, to present. This was extremely helpful. I learned a lot, uh, as I always do when I listen to your sessions. So we really appreciate it. And uh, for everybody who attended the session, we thank you. And if you have any questions for Steve, his, uh, his info is on the screen there. Uh, but we have uh, another uh, panel coming up later on this afternoon about grants and grant success stories and how your CTA or NJTL can, or your organization can, uh, can use grants to your advantage. So we hope you uh, uh, attend that one. And with that being said, we will uh, adjourn for this session. And uh, we, again, we thank you for, for uh, attending our session and hope to see you at more down the road. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Have a great Thanks. one. Enjoy the rest of the open. Thanks. <laughs> sure will.